from a wonderful trip to Washington, D.C. for my Aikido. So all you wonderful folks on um, Instagram, jump over to Facebook Live or um, uh, a YouTube uh, Live because we're going to be doing a talk. I'm going to be talking about the immune protocols. Uh, that's something that you guys have been asking me for quite some time to talk about. So all you folks on Instagram, please jump over to Facebook Live and uh, in, on uh, YouTube Live, uh, and I'm going to be doing a little lecture, probably for about 20 minutes, and then we'll ask, do question and answers. Uh, hi, hi, love, Surfim, and CPO Falakis, and Koi, all you got wonderful folks, jump over to um, Facebook Live, and um, uh, I'm going to be doing a talk on, uh, on the immune protocols, which uh, CNY uh, talks a lot about. Uh, so all you folks on Instagram, jump over to Facebook Live. This is Dr. Magarelli, uh, CNY Fertility Colorado. We're going to be talking about all the various medications, answering some questions about that. Hello, Felicia on Facebook Live and Lacey on Facebook Live. So folks, jump over to Facebook Live. Uh, we're going to be talking about um, the various immune protocols. Uh, Stacy 22 jump over to Facebook Live. Because uh, goal, my goal today is to talk to you guys about the immune protocols. Hello, Chris Parasoto. I'm here. Hi, Chris. Thanks for jumping over. Well, you want, uh, if you don't have Facebook, um, Love Supreme, uh, jump over to, to uh, YouTube. Just go over to uh, YouTube Live, uh, CNY Fertility at YouTube Live. Anybody who has that link, please tell her. Um, I'll speak out loud the words that I'm talking, and you'll see on the screen here. But I like, I, 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 just so you know, um, I like to do the lecture every other week. Uh, this week, we're going to be talking about part one of the immune uh, protocols, quite a, quite a large amount of information, making babies Rivera. Jump over to Facebook Live, all you guys on Instagram, Facebook Live, YouTube Live, all kinds of live. Monica Penalasso from Florida, hello. Uh, Lacey, it's good to see you up. Uh, Oh, Melissa, thank you. Thank you for loving my lives. I love my lives too. Tanisha, uh, thank you. Brittany, uh, hello. Uh, Smarty Jones and Ashantia Campbell, jump over to Facebook Live uh, because uh, Facebook or YouTube Live, we're going to be doing a talk on modulating the immune system and infertility care and why we might do it. And uh, we're going to be talking about the CNY fertility um immune protocol. So uh, everybody who's on, hello, hello, Remy. Hello, uh, Joey and Monica. Thank you for jumping over to Facebook Live and uh, YouTube Live. Um, so all you folks on Instagram, jump over to Facebook Live, YouTube Live, because we're going to be talking about um, immune protocols. We're going to be talking about uh, the various medications. Um, kind of answer some questions. I've been slowly but surely developing a conversational style for this field. Um, it's, uh, I would say, um, uh, challenging to say the least. Uh, so all you folks on Instagram, if you wouldn't mind, Cherry Bomb, uh, Mel8306, uh, Alisa Rosa, jump over to Facebook Live, uh, Black and Black Beauty, Mrs. Kampa, jump over to Facebook Live. Hughes of Gray, jump over to Facebook Live or YouTube Live, CNY Fertility. Um, hello, Roxana um, from Las Vegas. Nice to see you. Monica from Florida. Nice to see you all. Um, Nicknack021087, jump over to Facebook Live. Tandris, um, please, uh, 17, jump over to Facebook Live. I'm Dr. Magarelli. I'm not Dr. Mag. Someone's calling me Dr. Mag, M A G. It's Mag Dr. Mag, M A G. Uh, just waiting on my cycle day one. I'm 46 and this is my first month. My cycle hasn't been regular. Still getting ourselves started. Fantastic, Monica. So all you folks, um, I'm going to stop talking to you folks slightly as soon here on, on Instagram. Jump over to uh, from Instagram to Facebook Live or um, Alyssa Rose, you got over. Fantastic. Um, anybody who's on Instagram, jump over to Facebook Live, YouTube Live and and uh, we're going to be talking about um, uh, immune, uh, modulating the immune system. I'm Dr. Magarelli, CNY Fertility Colorado. Another beautiful day, sunshine, blue skies. It's getting warm. Uh, it's about 73, but we got beautiful snow on the mountains. Um, 
just got back from a wonderful trip to uh, Washington, D.C., and my dear friend, Dr. Kills, jumped on a plane, came down, and we had dinner uh, while I was down there. I was down there for an Aikido uh, seminar, which was wonderful, with uh, Sensei uh, Shihan uh, Hendricks and uh, Awama-style Aikido. Uh, hello from rainy North Carolina. <laughs> I wish I had sunny skies right now. Um, fantastic. Okay. So I'm going to change screens now. So all you folks on Instagram, please jump over to uh, Facebook Live. Lisa, Piara, Spokoker, Coco Monahan, jump over to Facebook Live, and we're going to be talking about the immune protocols, and I'm going to get started here right now. So you guys can listen on Instagram, but you can watch the uh, slideshow if you go to um, uh, Facebook, uh, Facebook Live or if you go to uh, YouTube Live, you'll see the actual slideshow. So, immune modulating the immune system in infer infertility care. I've been asked multiple times by m multiple patients to kind of help understand the immune protocols that we have in CNY. And what I've listed here, and by the way, these are on our website. They are also, um, uh, you can find them on our uh, family, building, family building guide. Uh, you can find them on our website, on our resource page. Uh, and, and what you'll see is that uh, these were created sort of in categories of, of, uh, of uh, severity of issues. So in our protocol one level, uh, of course, we strongly support low-carb eating. Uh, Dr. Kills has coined the term Kills is uh, keto, but really what he's talking about is um, uh, uh, low-carb eating. Uh, also has recommended uh, one meal a day. Well, most folks, um, yeah, they don't do very well with one meal a day, but certainly two meals a day is considered reasonable. Um, uh, movement absolutely is critical, and sometimes supplements. Um, in our protocol level one, we recommend, uh, uh, what's recommended is a low-dose naltrexone, and I'm going to talk about that today, aspirin, uh, which I'm going to talk about today, prednisone, again, uh, it's a steroid, I'm going to talk about that today, antibiotics, not today, antihistamine, yes, I'm going to talk about those today. And what you see is in the next protocol, they'll add things like intralipids and lovinox. And then in the next protocol, they're going to add uh, Nupagen, Prograf or Plaquenil, HCG boosters, PRP or HCG wash, and HGH. And then finally in protocol number four, <laughs> excuse me, we're, we're, uh, we're doing I, IVIG and Umera. Today, I'm really just going to be talking about the basic level, um, which is, um, well, why don't I just talk about it rather than talk about talking about it. So where did this all come from? And, and I found this wonderful paper on the immunology and immunotherapy of endometriosis, because in, endo in endometriosis, there's a physical reason why folks don't get pregnant, and then there is a... Uh, um, a physio, uh, I mean, a, a mechanical reason why people don't get pregnant, and then there's a physiologic reason, and then there's an immune uh, reason why people don't have either implantation, not getting pregnant, or that they have uh, less than optimal uh, pregnancy rates. So what was interesting is this slide is a nice, um, and you can get, it's called the immuno, Immunology and Immunotherapy of Endometriosis. You can download this yourself and read it all about it. It's uh, you actually it's uh, covered up. Let me uh, let me uncover it here. Get rid of the brand here. Uh, see if I can get rid of the brand. There be no brand. Let's see. Oh, I can't get rid of the brand, but it's basically called the Immunology and Immunotherapy of Endometriosis. And what you find at the center is that there are a variety of techniques. And if you look, the techniques that are in the immune protocols, uh, like uh, intralipids which is this bottom part here, arrow, Nupagen, spelled this way, and there's another way to spell it, low-dose naltrexone, and IVIG intralipids and steroids, and they work on different facets of the immune system. So all you guys on Instagram, jump over to Facebook Live or uh, YouTube Live because I'm doing a talk, and then in about the 20 minutes, I'll jump back to questions and answers. So all you folks that are on Facebook Live, I'm sorry, that are on Instagram, Jump over to Facebook Live or YouTube. 
And there are a lot of inflammatory markers associated with uh, endometriosis, which is one of the leading causes of infertility. Um, and then there are autoimmune issues that are associated with that. There are systemic immune uh, reactions, which things like anti-nuclear antibody reactions, um, uh, inflammation. And then there are a variety of, of ways we can implement it. So what uh, uh, CNY did was put together sort of a systematic way of um, approaching uh, the treatment of, of unexplained infertility. So here's the key. Unexplained infertility means you've uh, removed the issue of sperm. So normal semen analysis. And I can tell you that maybe in 3%, 5% of cases, we find a normal semen analysis. So automatically what that says to you, there's definitely a sperm issue. You've re eliminated eggs as an issue. So things like... Um, um, uh, the the um, uh, advanced maternal age, uh, uh, chromosomal changes of the egg again. But if you're alive, you're going to have uh, chromosomal issues with eggs, and you're going to have uh, the the loss of eggs. You've eliminated the uterus, so that means there's no mechanical like polyps or fibroids or scar tissue like Asherman syndrome or you've um, eliminated any kind of endometritis, you've eliminated any kind of poor um, endometrial response, you've eliminated, so, so that would be another thing you eliminated, tubal issues, which means you've um, uh, removed the tube or had uh, infections in the tube or have had a tubal ligation. So what I want to stress here is that these immune protocols are really, um, the icing on the cake of fertility care. You can do really well eating cake every day that doesn't have icing on it. So I want to stress that if you're doing these immune protocols, you're really um, adding on to a very well-established way of managing uh, your fertility, which is through uh, IVF. Um, so I, I guess I'm going to leave this one up here for now. So a lot of these things that you see as additions really uh, have come into play when we don't understand why folks aren't getting pregnant. So if you have a very severe male factor, immune protocols are not going to change that. If you have a very few eggs, immune protocols are not going to change that. If you have a uterine issue, immune protocols are not going to change that, like a septum or bicornual uterus. Um, um, so, so... So there, so when you, when you see these protocols, don't feel compelled that you have to do everything on the protocol because the protocols are really were extracted from research on very subtle issues related to fertility. They're not the mainstay. They're not the, the meat and potatoes. They're the, either the dessert or the, the icing on a cake. So let's just go through a few of them. So the first one we're going to talk about is steroids. Everybody knows that steroids are anti-inflammatory, but they also uh, suppress the immune system. And what they found was that in patients who have endometriosis with antibodies, like anti-nuclear antibodies or inflammation, that if you suppress that, you can actually get an improvement in, in, uh, in pregnancy outcomes if you are positive for this antibody. But if you weren't positive for the antibody, as you can see here, you know, 46% in the control group got pregnant, 45% in the treated group got pregnant. So there's really no difference. Um, whereas in this study in 2021, which is uh, um, a, a study looking at steroid use in IVF with antibodies present, 80% of the folks who had the antibody present were helped with the uh, prednisone. But no, but if they didn't get the president's on, they didn't see an improvement in outcomes. So yes, uh, adding, and we do add uh, prednisone uh, to our treatment uh, protocols. However, what this is suggesting is that just simply adding them is not going to, uh, unless you have a problem, it may or may not help outcomes. And I think the, the summary statement is it probably doesn't help outcomes. So especially if you have an allergic response to it or you're not getting it, please don't worry about it. Um, and um, any of you guys on Instagram, please jump over to Facebook Live or YouTube Live. 
All you folks on Instagram, just jump over to Facebook Live, YouTube Live. I'm doing a little lecture, and then I'll come back to answer your questions. So that's one area where it could be plus or minus. So now what are endorphins? Those are those pleasure pleasure molecules. Um, you know, you can get uh, endorphins from swimming. You can get endorphins from kissing. You can get it from making love. You can get endorphins from uh, a good movie. You can get it from chocolate. So these are the pleasure molecules. Well, it turns out that, um, again, going back to endometriosis, that if you treat patients with low-dose naltrexone, um, the administration of low-dose of, of low as opposed to high-dose stimulates the endorphin release and allows for the immune system to modulate the central nervous system. So, so this means that if there is a, especially in PCOS patients, there is a, um, um, an over-secretion of, of, of hormones and a suppression of the central nervous system so by adding low-dose naltrexone, they have seen patients who see us to, uh, who, who get a benefit by the use of naltrexone by, I, I'm assuming, stimulating the endorphin release, which reduces their food consumption, which, re, which increases their weight loss, which allows them to improve their ovulation, which in turn improves their pregnancy chances, lowers their testosterone uh, uh, levels, so, so the role in, in this particular case for low-dose naltrexone may well be to help PCOS patients. It also has been shown to help patients who, have, who are obese um, and to adjust the insulin secretion. Now, I will talk about that low-dose naltrexone is now in the realm of, of alternative medical therapies for pain, for a, a, a whole world of things. So if you're doing low-dose naltrexone, you're sort of, of, of in, uh, enhancing the endorphin release in such a way that may improve outcomes. Again, not many studies on specifically IVF patients, not many studies looking at um, statistically how it can help. Um, we really may not understand exactly how it does help, but it does appear to help patients with PCOS, obesity, insulin resistance, uh, improve their reproductive outcomes in some studies. Okay, folks, all of you guys on Instagram, I'm uh, doing a lecture on uh, YouTube Live as well as Facebook Live. So if you jump over there, you'll see the lecture in about uh, 20 minutes. We'll talk, I'll do some questions and answers. So now, Trexone has been shown to help prevent uh, the manifestations of disease and improve quality of life. You know, um, one of the things that the CNY is famous for is this holistic approach, you know, to reducing stress, doing yoga, breathing exercise, mindfulness, you know, good nutrition, sleeping. So in a sense, uh, low-dose naltrexone could be an adjunct to that, and it basically upregulates the endogenous opioid or feel-good activity, um, and it, it may have a. Uh, it has been suggested that it promotes uh, stress re uh, resilience, a social bonding, and emotional well-being. Well-being, and as you know, um, fertility can be fairly stressful for that. So you can think of it as, in a sense, a a, a bomb to calm you, much like maybe massage or um, deep breathing or meditation. So again, what you're hearing me say is that there's not data to support that it changes your fertility outcome from a direct cause and effect, but it may certainly um, contribute to well-being, which in turn, of course, has got to help you. So essentially, it's considered a um, alternative medicine, much like acupuncture, yoga, stress, exercise. It treats a whole plethora of, uh, of uh, diseases or has been used in a whole plethora of diseases to help. There isn't definitive data to say that it's going to change your reproductive outcomes, but it may well change your experience of the process, which may lead you to do continued care. So that's just something to consider there. But again, if you can't take it or you have a response to it that's not positive, please do not worry about it. So steroids and antibi antibiotics, uh, when I was growing up, uh, the Jacques Cohen study of 1990, I was there when it came out. 
They talked about, um, they were concerned about the zona pellucida, of the, which is the clear shell or the egg shell around the embryo. Uh, if you breach it or touch it, an infection may occur or inflammation may occur. And of course, he did a teeny weeny 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 study and was looking at cleavage stage embryos. And of course, at that time, they got only a 12% chance of improved pregnancy. So if you could get 13 or 14%, you would be well on your way. But um, we're now using blastocyst transfer. We're doing assisted hatching. We're doing decapitation of the embryo, which is just taking the zona pellucida off. We're doing zona drilling, um, you know, with laser. Um, we're not seeing the kind of impact that you would expect if truly the uh, glucocorticoids and antibiotics made a hill of beans difference. So in this study, which is a fairly recent study, they did not find any difference. Uh, it's an oldie but a goodie, uh, but not such a goodie adjunct for IVF, especially in, in blastocyst transfers. So if you can do it or you do do it, it, just again, think of it as a choice, but not a necessity. That's like flying coach versus um, coach plus. Uh, or, you know, it's just you're going to get to your destination of a baby just as fast. Um, so you may use it, you may not use it. I wouldn't worry if you don't. And if you do, there doesn't seem to be much of a negative to it. But again, look, it adds expense. So what I want you to think about uh, before I have two more slides is when you start telling me that you've done research on a subject, um, and you do, uh, and I appreciate that you do, um, make sure you know the year in which those studies were uh, published. For example, studies in the 80s and 90s they no longer apply to what we're doing in the 2020s at all. Even the 20 to 20, the year 2000 to 2010, those studies, you know, we are massively bigger studies. Now, there are some fundamental studies that we're not going to repeat. But if you're looking for research on a particular treatment, Google Scholar allows you to limit um, your publications to 2015 and sooner or one year ago or two years ago. So look at the age in which that study was done. Second, make sure you know what kind of embryo you have. Is it going to be a cleavage stage embryo, which is a day two or three? Or are you looking at a blastocyst transfer, which is a day five, six, or seven? So for example, a cleavage stage embryo is like working with a caterpillar. So that's before it becomes a butterfly, which is what a blastocyst is. So their physiologies are very different between a caterpillar and a butterfly. So when you're looking at studies, if it applies to a cleavage stage embryo, it does not necessarily mean it, it will help a patient getting a blastocyst transfer. Where was the study done? In Europe, their research is heavily, uh, the IVF is heavily regulated, which means uh, they are very limited on the number of embryos, how many, whether or not they can freeze them, whether or not they can transfer them, whether they can do reciprocal and all these things. So their research is very different than U.S.-based research. So if you're in the U.S., you may very well want to look at the U.S.-based data. So those are things to remember. And by the way, all of these lectures are recorded. You can, you can look at them later and see the, read the slides. But that's the idea behind that slide. What about Nupagen? Um, it's a it's a um, it's used as a G uh, C C S F uh, factor. It's used for the management of implantation uh, failures. Uh, it's used in both fresh and frozen, and it, it it affects the T cells and dendritic cells of endometrial expression of genes, which have a role in the implantation process. So, in those, if you have recurrence implantation failure, now what the hell is that? That's where you put in a chromosomally normal embryo and it doesn't stick. Uh, you never get pregnant at all, ever. It's not for people with miscarriages. It's not for people with babies. You know, essentially you're not getting implantation. It might improve, might. Again, small studies, very little data. Almost, you can almost in one hand look at the data and whether or not it's useful in a particular situation is hard to tell because the studies aren't there. So if you do use it, fantastic. If you don't, don't sweat it because there's, like I said, most IVF protocols have everything you need to make a baby without the additional add-ons. What about aspirin? Now that's interesting. Baby aspirin or low-dose aspirin uh, really seems to be effective across the board 
uh, in terms of helping folks in there. And this is a very big, nice study, 13 randomized controlled trials. And essentially what they found is that it improves pregnancy rate. Uh, it may improve pregnancy rate in IVFXC patients. Uh, it, it works through a reduction in uh, platelet aggregation, which is these micro infarcts that are found in the placenta that can cause a miscarriage. They sometimes call them subchorionic hemorrhages. And the nice thing is that low dose aspirin can also help with fetal retardation growth, uh, um, uh, uh, high um, recurrent abortion, and uterine ovarian perfusion. So it has a lot of positives with pretty much near few negatives. So this is one of those things where, yeah, everybody should be on a low dose aspirin and, and um, it's a reasonable thing to do unless you have an allergy. And then finally, for this talk today, because it's almost uh, 25 after, antihistamine protocol, we have an antihistamine protocol as part of the level one, two, three, and four. Claritin, as well as other antihistamines, um, apparently, if you have overproduction of, of histamines, you can have some inhibition of implantation. However, if you have normal production of, of uh, histamines, there may be a negative effect on, on outcomes. So it's not one size fit all. I mean, a patient called me up today and said, I want to add Nupogen. I said, to what? Well, I just want to add Nupogen to something. Why is that? Well, my friend had it. Well, yes, and you might read about it in Friends, but it may not be. It's a, it's a very powerful medication unless you have some issues with uh, implantation. Um, you may or may not need it. So my goal in letting you understand that there are data that uh, to support the various uh, types of medications in the immune level one, two, three, and four, there isn't a lot of strong randomized controlled trials, except for the aspirin in this case, um, that demonstrate its efficacy. And you will find it on what's called the IVF add-on pages of the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, the European Society for Reproductive Medicine, the various um, regulatory boards around the world, and especially in those countries which pay for for um, for IVF, you may uh, you may find that they're actually told not to be used. Okay. So um, let's go. I'll just go one more slide. I think. And then I'll go to questions and answers. Yeah, we'll do some questions and answers now. So um, again, this is part one. Uh, there's probably three or four more parts, which I will discuss more of the, uh, the different types of medications we have on our immune protocol list. Uh, my goal is education, information, helping you make good decisions. My goal also is to reduce anxiety because a lot of people feel like they have to do every single thing. Uh, you don't. Uh, the vast majority of patients will get pregnant with basic egg, sperm, uterus, medications, hormones, uh, and cycle management. That's probably 98, 97% of our patients. Uh, what is the minimal medication protocol for retrieval? We tend to say level two. And so uh, let me just go back to there for a second. Let me see this uh, go to and show. So let's go here. So the protocol two is basically low carb eating. Acupuncture, by the way, is in all of these protocols. Uh, low dose naltrexone, again, feel good, feel good drug. Aspirin, yes. Prednisone, questionable antibiotics. We didn't talk about that yet. Uh, plus minus antihistamines, again, plus minus. We didn't talk about intralipids or Lovenox, but that N plus an HCG wash, I like to call it a two plus. We tend to see that. Um, yeah, Lonnie says, you know, I have the feeling like everything but the kitchen sink protocols. Honestly, in most cases, that's not needed. That's not needed. Okay, I am going to uh, go to the questions now and Instagram, I'm back on live and it says we are experiencing implantation failures. At present, we are doing the recommended protocols but have not had been on massage or acupuncture. Well, acupuncture certainly has been demonstrated to be helpful, so please do that. Massage certainly is, is useful, although we don't have data to, to tell you one way or the other if it helps. 
Um, the, uh, so acupuncture is important. Uh, low carb or avoiding sugars is very important. How long are you on a protocol before retrieval? Well, um, usually uh, you start uh, either concurrent with that, that um, uh, retrieval, or you could do it starting, some of them you can start as, as soon as like the baby aspirin, uh, the low dose naltrexone, those are things you could start earlier. Uh, most of them are in, in concert with your, uh, your treatment cycle. So about two to four weeks. Um, I was wondering about the keto diet. My cycle seems to be irregular. Dr. Google says a keto diet can lead to irregular cycles of amenorrhea. What do I think? What do I know about that? Tina, that makes no sense. There may be observational things about regularity, but uh, reducing sugars reduce insulin. Insulin reduces androgens. Androgen reduces irregular periods. So now nah, the mechanism up there doesn't make much sense. Based on your symptoms, but mainly found through lap of whoops. Could my food allergies cause extra inflammation in my body and affect IVF outcomes? Absolutely, Melissa. Um, Lovenox with a history of miscarriage. Yes, praying for you. I agree. Is it true that if I have surgery to see if I have endometriosis, it would lower my ovarian reserve? Not necessarily, Felicia. Unless they had to do massive work on the ovary, which means you have a problem. It, it, uh, it, any surgery can reduce ovarian reserve, but... What's good at, of having ovarian reserve if you never get pregnant? So it's a little bit of a catch-22. Uh, what do you recommend for low morphology? Um, well, see a urologist. That's really important. A serovital is something that I, I really recommend. It's a growth hormone secreted got for everybody. Um, you can do, um, there's not a lot you can do to change your morphology, uh, but you can avoid alcohol, tobacco, drugs, of course, marijuana being a big one. Um, and that would help, especially get rid of tobacco. That would help. Uh, but it's not going to change the morphology, but it may, may change the function. Um, my pregimmune test showed paternal antibodies. What would I need? IVIG. Um, please uh, refer yourself to Dr. Kills. That's not a test that I use or recommend. Uh, Amber. Uh, hi, Dr. Mags. My regular OB put me on metformin and diagnosed me with PCOS. However, my labs don't indicate that I have low AMH. And I have a, could this negatively impact me? Well, Amber, um, uh, you have to decide if you want your, your doctor to manage your, your PCOS or do you want to work with us to manage your PCOS? Um, there are some doctors who definitely recommend uh, metformin. I recommend a low carb diet. Um, uh, they, okay. All righty. Does Hashimoto's cause infl inflammation elsewhere in the body? Yes, in the ovaries in particular. All my other thyroid labs are good. Yes, Jesse, it definitely can cause uh, reduced ovarian reserve. Um, I know you have mentioned stims can be given in the deltoid if you have high BMI. Can citratide go in a deltoid also? Yes, yeah, Shani, absolutely. Anything, as long as it gets in that lovely muscle, you are okay. Are the immune protocols used only for IVF? Yes. But in an IUI, the immune protocol one, which is simply aspirin, prednisone, antibiotics, antihistamines, could be used in an IUI cycle if there's reasons. Again, everything has to have a good reason. Um, all righty. Well, listen, would it, would it help to take this for a few months after multiple failed FETs? Uh, Lee, Blanc, Katie, well, you want to first find out if you have endometriosis, my dear. Andre, uh, I, I don't know if that's a male. Let me say one second. This is Dr. Kiltz. Hey, Dr. Kiltz, I'm on a live now. How are you? Okay, Dr. Kiltz says hello to everybody. He's praying for great outcomes for everybody, and I'll talk to you later. Thanks, Robert. God bless. Bye bye. All righty. So, um, Thank you so much, DNC hysteroscopy. We're this month. I'm hoping to see you soon. Good. Uh, if I have high NK cells, how do you reduce them? Well, it's interesting that you say that, but intralipids, steroids, um, uh, if I can go back here, uh, give me just a second here. Uh, IVIG, these are all associated with reductions in NK cells. Um, but it's funny, there's, um, there's a controversy on how much is too low or whether they're bad or not. 
So Felicia, I need to get my fallopian tubes removed. Uh, 36. Always do your egg retrieval first, Felicia. Egg retrieval first. Um, I only have one problem. My AMH level is low. What do I have to do? Kia, love, love. Well, IVF and get those eggs out, make embryos as soon as possible. Um, or Alyssa, would it help to take for a few? Oh, God, I'm getting the same message over and over again. Hmm, that's kind of odd. I have mast cell activation syndrome. Will that affect egg retrieval? Will it affect implantation? Well, that's an inflammatory process. So in that case, I think um, either seeing a reproductive immunologist that might be, uh, uh, I would say that that's at a level that's uh, way above my pay grade. In other words, I don't, I don't know a lot about mast cell uh, activation. So that's, that's something that I would see a reproductive immunologist about. Um, certainly anything that can suppress that would help would be my guess. Um, but I don't know that much about it, to be honest with you. Uh, uh could a complex cyst cause my ovary to stop producing follicles or is it just coincidental? Do you recommend removal prior to continuing the next cycle? Dana, yes, a complex cyst, depending on its size, can reduce access to follicular growth by reducing the per perfusion of the ovary. So that certainly can be an impediment. I'm not a big surgery guy unless you absolutely have to, but if you have to, to get eggs to respond, do it. Rebecca, for diminished ovarian reserve, why is high protocol normally started before mini? I've read a lot of papers with good results on lower doses and had a hard time finding medical information on high dose. No, all of the information out there is on high dose. There's very few papers on mini. There's, those few papers do suggest that they may be helpful. Um, but uh, the reason we start with a conventional, not high dose, conventional, the stuff that works, conventional, the stuff that works. Mini is less. That's what mini means. So give less. Well, giving less in a person who has few eggs may result in even fewer embryos. Um, how long with secondary unexplained infertility failed IO do you recommend moving to IVF? Uh, six months. Uh, or Alyssa Lab and test show no endometriosis. So then would it help to take it for a few months? I have no idea because it would be a drug for no reason. Hi, I've been diagnosed with factor five. We have lost three babies for the past year. We have been, we have tried. Now, should I be taking baby aspirin? Yes, I think if you can. If my iron is low and vitamin D is low, can I still do egg retrieval next month? Yes, but add iron and add vitamin D. Uh, I was put on a protocol with IVIG. Can I skip IVIG and only do intralipids if it won't make a difference? Any strong studies on IVIG? Well, a lot of people, Roxana, seem to think that the IVIG can help. Um, I haven't seen any strong data that it does. So you can do the best you can. Which office is better, Colorado or Syracuse? We didn't have a great experience with Albany. None of us, it's just people. There's no offices. They're just people. Uh, we're happy to help. Uh, if you haven't had a good experience one place, you certainly can try. Uh, but we all work together with a common philosophy of patients first. And I'm sorry you had a bad experience there. First, fresh failed. Do you prefer to jump back into for retrieval or wait a month or two? Don't wait. For those of you who are trying to make embryos to make babies, do back-to-back -back cycles. Because you lose anywhere between 1,000 and 10,000 eggs every month. So waiting doesn't help you at all. Does a collagen supplement help anything or not related? Yeah, I don't know anything about it, Jesse. Uh, I'm looking to start IVF due to having tubes removed. How can I start the process? I've had seven natural pregnancies. Call our office, make an appointment. That's the process. Get an acupuncturist. That's ABORM certified, A-B-O-R-M.org. That's the website. Start taking Vital and download our free family building guide. Those are all good things, but get an appointment as soon as possible. Paige, I'm on a few vitamins from molecular fertility. I have no fertility issues, just block tubes as a reversal. What protocol would you recommend? Paige, we need your age, your AMH, the sperm issues, your uterus issues, uh, hormone issues. All of those are important in determining a protocol. Um, all righty. Okay. Uh, if I had a retrieval uh, this month and I'm planning to transfer frozen embryos next June, hmm. Any recommendation meds to improve implantation? Yes. Well, uh, do the vitamins, do the acupuncture, do zero vital, and depending on your age, you might even do uh, growth hormone priming. Avoid alcohol, tobacco, drugs. Do a low-carb diet. Those are all things you can do. 
Do you recommend cerovital along with avacitol? Absolutely, Lani. Um, I heard there is an office in Florida. Yes, in Sarasota, but it only does monitoring, and I don't. It might be doing IUIs, but it's not doing IVF. Um, is AMH of 2.2 promising at age 38? Jesse, absolutely. Absolutely. Hi, folks on Instagram. Thanks for uh, joining me. It's Dr. Magarelli from CNY Fertility Colorado. We're answering questions. Um, can you give something to try first naturally before IVF? Yes, there's, uh, depending on your age, Akia, love, love. Um, it depends on your husband's sperm. It depends on your uterus. What is Avastatol used for? It it's, uh, helps regulate insulin resistance. Thanks for the kisses. How often should we do acupuncture? There are absolutely protocols. It's nine treatments before the retrieval and about, and if you're doing a frozen, then it's about eight treatments before the frozen or at least two treatments before the fresh transfer. I have a balanced uh, translocation and I've lost seven. Only one was able to be interested in, okay. Should I do any other testing for recurrent loss? Well, that's a good reason, uh, the balanced translocation for the losses, um, but make sure you haven't got a polyp or other issues. Yeah, you kind of want to know and then go back to doing IVF with PGT, um, with uh, PGTSR. That's what you want. Uh, wondering, can you test for whether you should be a Claritin, Benadryl, and Pepside? Well, I, th I don't know if there's a histamine test. I'm betting there are. We tend to give it ubiquitously, um, but um, I'm, I, it must be. After transfer, is sex okay the week after, or do we need to wait until heartbeat? Well, there's a lot of controversy about that. Um, so um, I think intimacy is important. Uh, but remember, if you do miscarry or if there is some bleeding, you're going to blame yourself, you know, until you're sure your baby's kind of, uh, the heartbeat is kind of that point. So, yeah, uh, you can make that. Just, oh, my daughter has said hi. Hi, Amber. Thank you for the, for the beautiful hearts. Uh, what is zero vital for? It's a growth hormone secretagog. It improves your own body's growth hormone. Um, how long do I stay on Lovenox, prednisone, LVN after positive beta? I would talk to the nurses and your OB about that. Are antihistamines part of every protocol? They are at CNY, but they don't have to be. Um, if I produce only four embryos, do you suggest PGT testing? Well, only four. I think that's a good number four. It has nothing to do with the number of embryos you make that you do PGT testing. It has to do with age and a variety of other things. What is the dose you recommend in acetone, myonacetophil for someone with PCOS? I don't. I just read the label. It's on the back of the label what dose you should take. Um, so I don't have a specific dose. Um, can anything be done to help with the growth of follicles during stem? That's what the fertility medicines are for in acupuncture. Is any acupuncture better than nothing? Yes. Yes. So if you can do the pre and post, uh, that's great. Um, that's great. Um, two failed transfers of one fresh FET with five day embryos, planning another egg retrieval next month and plan a transfer day three. Do you recommend fresh or frozen? Fresh. I had my tubes tied. Any additional medications recommended when we experience transfer failures? Well, you can add growth hormones, zero vital. You can do acupuncture. Make sure you're, you're avoiding alcohol, tobacco, especially, and drugs. Um, but I think growth hormone is probably your best bet, and you can get an injectable. Uh, if we're using an egg donor, do you encourage PGT testing? No, I don't, uh, Julie Oswald Howlett. Uh, hi, Dr. M. I'm testosterone cream, feeling bloated and sore in my upper abdomen. This is a common side effect. Should I lower my dose? My testosterone was less than three. So you're using the testosterone cream. I'm assuming it was prescribed for you by somebody. Um, I mean, it could have been me, but I, I don't know. Um, I tend not to. Um, uh, if, Yeah, I, I would have to know a little bit more. I have two egg retrievals with CNY Colorado. No one has directed or suggested me to take antihistamines, Harpna. Well, there, it depends on which protocol you're taking. If you're taking protocol one, two, three, or four, most of them are there. So make sure you, you ask for it. But again, it has a positive or negative effect. We do not know. 
How long should you be on baby aspirin for the first 21 weeks is what we recommend of the pregnancy. Um, so again, what my goal in talking about the immune protocols is to help you understand that none of them are required. None of them really, except for maybe the aspirin, baby aspirin have been shown to uh, uh, are definitive in their, uh, their ability to help um, uh, better the outcomes. So these are, these are add-ons uh, when, uh, you know, as a way to say, hey, I don't know what's going on. Maybe this will help, but they really don't have a, you have to do this kind of thing. Um, failed fresh transfer two chemicals before IVF just turned 35. Should I transfer one or two for my FET, Sara Lee? Well, I don't know if you have any embryos left. If you have embryos left and you're 35, then, um, and you've tried uh, one, then you can try two. If you haven't any embryos, then I would do PGTA to see what's going on. Um, is there any specific baby aspirin you recommend? Absolutely not. No, none whatsoever. Um, and it's 100 milligrams. That's really what it is. On our donor egg journey, we are learning, leaning towards fresh eggs, yet frozen transfer. Hmm. Don't know why you're leaning that way. Nupagen, which is better? I have no idea, ma'am, what those two drugs are. Hope. I'm sorry if I already answered this, but what does the antihistamine help with? Well, it, it, if you have excess histamines, it's been shown to lower implantation. If you have normal histamines, the antihistamines are shown to lower implantation. So ugh, there's no real clear answer there. How long should we take baby aspirin? I, I was taking it off at positive beta. Perfect. That's fine. But you can take it up to 21 weeks. Do I need aspirin if I'm on Lovenox? Uh, it's not on my protocol. Well, the Lovenox is like super, super duper um, aspirin. So, you know, I don't think there's a study comparing them. There may be, but I don't, I've never seen one. Um, is a day three morular or a day three nine considered PCOS? Need uh, Whoa, wait a second. Is a day three morular or a day three nine considered better? Um, okay, got it. Uh, neither of them, because both of them have probably the same implantation. Uh, waiting for consultation in July. What can I take now to prepare my body? Cereal vital, um, uh, prenatal vitamins, folic acid, CoQ10. Anti so look up and download our family building guide. And there's innumerable information about the, what you can take. I just had my consult today with a nurse practitioner. We are doing a reciprocal IVF with no fertility issues. We are wanting to do fresh. And the MP told us that CMY doesn't often do fresh and didn't really listen to us. And put we are doing frozen in our charts anyways. Is that okay? Um, the reason, Megan, on reciprocal, um, um, the reason we with reciprocal IVF, you, you don't want the complexity of adding another partner's menstrual cycle is why not optimize? Why not optimize? You really want to optimize one for eggs and one for the uterus. Uh, and the timing of if it lands on a Sunday, we're not open on a Sunday, and Thursday afternoons, we're not open. So it's just a better way to coordinate. It's not that you can't do it fresh. It's just the amount of complications. It's complicated enough. What test measures the amount of histamines? I don't know. Someone asked me that already. If you search CNY support group, fresh gays seem to be the best overall, but frozen can work too. That's not true at all. Uh, fresh eggs do not work better than frozen by any stretch in any literature anywhere. So that's not uh, true. Uh, do you reckon do more people do fresh is not the same thing better. Okay. It's not the same thing as better. Um, how many failed IUI should happen before IVF? Six. At what point in the transfer cycle would you take the growth hormone? Uh, be at the start of the um, medication cycle. Um, which is better, go to left 450 or Follistin? They're exactly the same, LNR. Um, I have endometriosis, so I will do a frozen. Um, that's not related. Those are not related. Um, you mentioned you prefer fresh egg transfer. We would advise to do frozen. No, I didn't say I preferred fresh egg transfer. That's not what I said. 
um, in situations where you have failed or you don't grow blastocysts, it's reasonable to try a day three fresh transfer. In those situations where you only have one embryo, it's reasonable to do a fresh transfer. In those where you have five, six, 10 embryos, it's best to do a frozen transfer. In those cases where you have PCOS, it's best to do a frozen transfer. In those cases where you have excessive estrogen uh, during the menstrual, during the stimulation cycle, it's best to do uh, frozen. Um, egg donor, what's highest success rates, uh, fresh or frozen? Exactly the same. Can you please tell me about the antihistamine protocol? It's just three medications that we use uh, to stimulate um, uh, or to reduce, and, and uh, uh, that's Pepsid, Claritin, and Benadryl. So it's just the medication you take. If I do IVF, the baby will look like the mom or the dad. The IVF has nothing to do with what the baby looks like. It has to do with the chromosomes that are provided in the sperm and the chromosomes that are provided in the egg. Um, do you recommend weekly intralipids? If so, until what week? I only did it once a day before transfer, currently five weeks with twins. Well... Why are you worried about it <laughs> if, you're, if you're doing well? Um, again, not a lot of data on the use of intralipids and, and fertility. Um, it's a, a low, uh, low carb, moderate protein, high fat diet would probably work just as well. It can help uh, with the immune system if that's an issue. If it's not an issue, then it's not going to help. Um, so, so, the best thing I can suggest is there has to be a reason to do everything. How do you feel about PGT testing at 40? Well, the data shows that between 35 and 40, you get the best impact of PGT testing. Over 40, not so much. Under 35, not so much. So if you're over 40, put the embryos in. My second cycles was a day two transfer. It failed, is that normal? Um, not sure what the question is. When stopping estrogen or progesterone, do you wean at 10 weeks or can you stop immediately? You can stop immediately. Um, I had a total of 34 eggs retrieved with three cycles, 18 fertilized, 11 made it to blast, seven tested abnormal, four untested. Would you suggest fresh or frozen with the next? I would do fresh. How far before retrieval do you recommend the Pepsi Claritin Benadryl regimen, at least uh, during, during that process? During that, it's it's uh, it's really for the transfer. The uh, antihistamine protocol is really for the transfer. If you're doing a fresh transfer, then you could start it during the cycle. Can you take serovital after egg retrieval? Will it help for a frozen transfer? I believe it will, but there's no data to support that. Do you recommend um, Lupron priming for a 45 year old? We are trying to synchronize my follicles. AMH is 0 0.64. Lupron priming. I don't know what that is. Don't know what that is. I've had a uh, miscarriage. Is there anything you could recommend to help hold on to the baby? as his hope. Well, um, acupuncture has been shown to reduce miscarriages. Um, what would be the reason for a day two transfer? It's probably because Sunday was a day three. So you could do a day two or you could do Monday, which is a day four. That's the reason. Um, I don't think there's any other reason to do a day two transfer that I can think of, except for the office being opened or closed. Best diet while stimming and before retrieval, low carb, moderate protein, high fat, less than 50 grams of carbs a day. That seems to be a nice little sweet spot. What do I feel is more beneficial on HCG wash or intralipids? I would go with the HCG wash. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, you're welcome, Lanny. So I'm Dr. Magarelli, CNY Fertility Colorado. I always forget to say that. Uh, this is my lecture week. Uh, we talked about the immune protocols uh, one, two, three, and four at CNY. It's posted on our website. It's posted in our family building guide. Um, the goal of it is to help those patients who have problems with immune system, help those patients where they continuously fail, but it's, it's not for the, the newbie. You know, it's, it's kind of, uh, yeah, the goal is to try to help improve your outcomes. 
Um, and sometimes we preemptively do it, but you really don't have to. Um, uh, Angela, we had a pregnancy loss several months ago. And my cycles have been very irregular. Anything we recommend in balance hormones while waiting? Yeah. Find out why they're irregular if they haven't been before. If block twos, will intralipids be helpful? Yes, because it's the helping in the uterus. Patricia, I'm going to be doing another retrieval and PGT testing. Can I do a fresh transfer and test all the others? I have inconclusive embryo left as well, trying to decide what to do. Well, you could get it tested, the inconclusive, by biopsying it again. Uh, you can use one of your embryos, uh, but again, it could be abnormal. It could be an abnormal baby. If you're spending the money on PGT testing, it seems it makes sense to get them all tested. Is uh, fresh sperm always better than frozen for making embryos? Nope. After 10 days stint, they only found one mature follicle. I canceled the cycle and I've started all over the next month. What should be done differently? I have PCOS. Maurice, Marcy, Lorena, Archie, you need to tell me a little bit more about you. Things to balance hormone with PCOS, uh, uh, inositol, uh, myo-inositol, a low-carb diet, um, acupuncture. Those are very helpful to balance hormones with PCOS. I recently had a chemical pregnancy. Do you think an antihistamine protocol would be beneficial? Our first FUT was successful without it. Yeah, miscarriages are totally normal. So don't start taking drugs for having a totally normal process. If your tubes are blocked, can you still conceive? Yes, with IVF. How many days before transfer do you start progesterone? Six to six and a half, depending on whether it's fresh or frozen. So six to six and a half. Six days with frozen, six and a half with fresh. Uh, how long does a patient typically stay on antihistamine protocol? Usually during the month of their, uh, usually during the implantation month. The frozen embryo transfer month would be logically what would make sense uh, because that's what you're looking for is the implantation. The implantation occurs and things start growing. I, I don't necessarily see a reason. If I suspect I have endometriosis, would you suggest laparoscopic surgery for an egg retrieval? Yeah, it depends on how old you are, yes. Can you get your tubes unblocked? Um, people have tried. It's not the optimal choice, but uh, depending on, yeah, it just depends on where the blockage is, etc. What do you think about taking low-dose Lupron to synchronize my follicles? Low-dose Lupron. Um, birth control pills can is probably a better. I don't know why we would do low-dose Lupron unless there's something funky going on, but you're 45. Um, I would just simply do retrievals, man. I wouldn't spend any time. I would prime, if anything, with growth hormones, serial vital. The synchronization, I don't think, is your issue at 45 with an AMH of 0 0.6. Um, hi. Can't wait to go to CMY. I'm in Nashville, Tennessee. Where are you all at? Uh, we're in Colorado Springs, Colorado, Karen. Actually, I'm going to Chattanooga, Tennessee, to an Ironman with my wife, Dr. Diane Credenda, the acupuncturist. Uh, next month, she's doing a half Ironman. So um, Chattanooga. How many acupuncture visits would you recommend prior to FET? Uh, uh, twice a week and probably eight. Uh, is growth hormone for priming omnitrope? Absolutely. Uh, if I have 10 eggs retrieved, would you suggest fresh or frozen about 40% blast rate? That's a great one. Um, again, it depends. Um, you have, so that means you have four embryos, right? Uh, if you've done a cycle before, yeah, I mean, there's no reason not to do a fresh. Um, not, yeah. I'm 43, low AMH, no twos. What do you recommend I need to do IVF and also possibly don donor IVF? How often may I have acupuncture prior to a frozen transfer every two, twice a week? Um, will you please repeat what you can do to balance hormones? Well, uh, for a PCOS, myo-inositol or avocetol, um, low-carb, moderate-protein, high-fat diet, carbs less than 50 grams a day, acupuncture. Um, those are things that you can help with to balance hormones with PCOS. Uh, uh, so four embryos. Uh, how old are you, uh, Rosanna? I don't know how old you are. Uh, um, and is this your first cycle? What is the crest dosage for baby? It's 100 milligrams, 100 milligrams for baby Ashman, 100 milligrams. Wow, it's five o'clock already. Well, 
Oh, you're 46. Uh, then do a fresh transfer, Rosanna, uh, Roxana. So anybody, thank you. Wow, it's uh, five o'clock. Well, it's been a lovely, lovely, quick hour. Um, uh, and um, please contact our clinic if you do have questions. Um, we, the, the portal is the best way to do it. I'd like to shout out to everybody who participates in this forum. I love seeing you guys. I mean, we have almost 100 folks online here. Um, we're, we hope we're helpful. My goal is to keep bringing you new information, uh, uh, spread information, accurate information, tell you what I believe in based on the data. Um, um, but what you believe in is what matters. Um, we're here to help. Um, our goal, of course, is uh, to make you better consumers. The better consumer you are, we feel like we provide an excellent service. Uh, we're challenged every day to be better at what we do, and we are very proud of that. For folks who are just joining me now on the uh, Instagram or, or on Facebook, or et cetera, I start at 4 p.m. Mountain Time, not 5. So um, next week, it'll be at 4 p.m. Mountain Time. Um, and next week, it'll be just uh, Facebook Live. And uh, I'm sorry, it'll be uh, all the channels will be live tomorrow. Um, so anyway, uh, thank you all for uh, joining me tonight. I'm Dr. Magarelli, CNY Fertility, and I will look forward to seeing you next time. You guys all be well. Thank you. Bye-bye. Here we go. God bless you. Thank you, Karen.